All right, you guys, so all of 7.2 is basically with proportions, and now we're doing the same thing with means, okay? So the exact same thing. And you want to just recognize the difference between proportions and means. So sample proportions are usually categorical. For example, what proportion of U.S. adults watch The Bachelor? Plus it says proportion, or if you're talking about a percentage or something, that's proportions. And the formulas that we learned for proportions were mu of p hat. So this is the mean of a whole bunch of little p hats is equal to the true proportion, right? And then we learned that the standard deviation of all the little p hats is equal to the square root of p times 1 minus p divided by n, right? So now we're going to do the same thing with sample means. Means are quantitative. For example, the mean of household incomes or the mean of like blood pressure or something, all right? So something numerical is typically a mean and something categorical is typically a proportion. Um, so we're not doing this activity, we're just talking about it. Uh, so you have a bag of pennies and you pass it around. We did this last year and it took a really long time. Um, so first everybody draws five pennies. So you have a simple random sample. You draw five pennies and you find the mean of the date, okay? And then you go up to the board and you put your little mean dot plot, like 1970, okay? Or whatever your mean was. And you make a dot plot for your, your simple random sample of size five. And then you do another one and you make a dot plot if you have size 25. So you go back through and the whole class takes out 25 pennies and you write down all the dates and you find the average and then you go put your one dot up there of what your date was. And what do you guys think happens when you increase the sample size? Anybody remember? Less variability. Okay? That's kind of the point of that. <laughs> um, all right. So making money. So figure A is a histogram of the earnings of a population of 61,742 households that have earned income greater than zero. That's good. Hope you would earn income greater than zero in the recent year. All right, so this is a whole bunch of people's income. And then we've got, so the distribution earned income population of all those people. And then we've got the mean earnings X bar of 500 simple random samples of N equals 100 households. So we took 500 samples. And each sample was 100 households. So this is the population distribution right here. And this is a sample distribution. So 500 simple random samples. So some things to notice. As we expect, the distribution of earned incomes is strongly skewed to the right and very spread out. So we have some really wealthy people making bank that are skewing our distribution to the right, okay? Um, and we cut off the earnings scale at 400000 to save space. There's people who make more than 400000 all right? But here's the mean. This is the true mean of the population, $69,750, okay? And then over here we have our simple random sample of the 100 households. The mean earnings in this sample is 66807 that's less than the mean of the population. Then they do another simple random sample of 100, and the mean of that one's 7,820, and that's higher than the mean of the population. But if we do it many, many times, what happens to our means, you guys? They're the same. They're the same. Okay? So as long as we take a whole bunch of simple random samples, the mean of our sampling distribution is going to be the same as the mean of our population. Even if our population is skewed, our means will be the same. Okay? So some notes to write down. <clears throat> sampling distributions of X bar. So again, sampling distributions is taking a whole bunch of samples. So they did size 100, and they did it 500 times, and they got a mean. So here's an important thing to write down. Mu of X bar. This is just like mu of P hat equals P when we're doing proportions. But now you want to write down mu of X bar equals mu. Mu of X bar is all of the little X bars 
a bunch of samples, right? So it's the mean of a bunch of samples is equal to the true mean. And then we have our standard deviation of the sampling distribution. This is just like saying sigma p hat when we're doing proportions, then you use this formula. For means, this is a new formula that you definitely want to write down. So sigma x bar is equal to sigma divided by the square root of n. So this is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution right here. Okay. This sigma is the true standard deviation divided by square root of n, and n is the sample size. And just like before, whenever we calculate out the standard deviation, what did we have to check? 10% condition. Same thing with means. All right, so if you're using that formula, sigma divided by square root of n, you have to check the 10% condition. Okay, these formulas are on the AP exam sheet, not the 10% one, but the mean and the standard deviation formulas are on there. AP exam tip, notation matters. Either use notation correctly or don't use it at all. Um, I would just learn how to use it correctly. I believe in you, all right? Uh, but basically, you'll lose credit if you label something incorrectly. So P hat, what is that, you guys? What, a statistic? Oh, yeah, a statistic. Okay. A <laughs> sample proportion. This is one sample proportion, all right? So we take one P hat. I asked 100 people if they watched The Bachelor last night, all right? And that would be one P hat. X bar is A sample what? Mean, okay? So I take 25 people and I average their height, all right? So it's one sample mean. What's P? Yep, this is the true proportion of the population. So it's the true uh, number of people, or not number, proportion of people who watch The Bachelor. And mu is the true mean. So it depends on what your population is. Maybe my population is Devlin, and I'm going to take the true mean height. Okay. This sigma would be the true standard deviation. By the way, whenever I say true, that all refers to the population. So just out of everybody. All right, then we have all the ones with subscript. So mu of p hat. This is the mean. Is this the mean? Yeah, no, the mean. Yeah, that's right. The mean of the sampling distribution. So I'm going to take a whole bunch of p-hats, all right? I'm going to ask 100 people 500 times how many watched The Bachelor last night, and then I'm going to make a lovely dot plot, and I get the mean of the sampling distribution, okay? And we have sigma p-hat, standard deviation of the sample proportions. So again, this is a whole bunch of p-hats, and there's formula for it, right? Okay. Now I have mu of x bar. This is another mean of sampling distribution. So this is when I take a whole bunch of random samples, and I find all their averages, and I make a dot plot. And it should be equal to the true mean. And then I have the standard deviation 
of the sample mean. And there's a formula for that, and you set the 10% condition. Okay. The behavior of x bar in repeated samples is much like that of the sample proportion p hat. So I would make a few notes here. The sample mean x bar is an unbiased estimator of the population mean mu. That's just like saying, right, mu of x bar is equal to mu, and it's unbiased. Okay? So the mean and sampling distribution is equal to the p-mean. The values of x bar are less spread out for larger samples. Their standard deviation decreases at the rate of the square root of n. In other words, your sampling distribution is less spread out than your population distribution. And the last part, the formula for standard deviation that you guys already wrote down. Again, just a reminder to check the 10% condition. You're only allowed to use it if the 10% condition is true. N is less than or equal to a tenth of N. And these facts are true no matter what shape the population distribution has. So if your population distribution is skewed, all these things are still true. All right? All right, so wine. This wine stinks. Mean and standard deviation of x bar. Um, sulfur compounds such as dimethyl sulfide are sometimes present in wine. DMS causes off odors in wine, so winemakers want to know the odor threshold, which is the lowest concentration of DMS that the human nose can detect. Extensive studies have found that the DMS odor threshold of adults follows the distribution with a mean of 25 micrograms per liter and a standard deviation of 7. Suppose we take a simple random sample of 10 adults and determine the mean odor threshold X bar for the individuals in the sample. What is the mean of the sampling distribution x bar? So just like we did proportions, you guys, this should be pretty easy. What is the mean of the sampling distribution? 25. It is equal to the true mean. Okay? Stay the same. What's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution? And, of course, they're not always going to tell you this, but you always need to check that the 10% condition is met. So n is less than or equal to one-tenth of n. What is our sample size n? 10, all right, less than or equal to a tenth of, what is our population that we're actually talking about? All adults, all right. Uh, there are at least 100 adults, right? So you could times by 10 on both sides, and you could say, yep, there's at least 100 adults that drink wine, okay? And so then we can actually calculate using our formula. Be sure you have the right notation. Okay, now I'm doing sigma of all the means is equal to the true standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And what did they tell us the true standard deviation is? 7. And what is n? 10, our sample size. And we get 2.214. What is this number? The standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Okay, so of those 10 people, what is the difference between the standard deviation of the population and the standard deviation of the sampling distribution? Smaller, right? There's less variability in our sampling distribution than in our population. All right. We have described the mean and standard deviation of sampling distribution of a, a sample mean but not its shape. So we're going to look at the shape. And we are going to go through this, so if you guys would find this in your book. Um, Sam, will you read the beginning part and number one?
animated. All right, so we've got the population at the top. What happens when I do uh, animated? What is this? Okay, they took a sample of five things. And then what does this blue one down here represent? The mean of those five things. Kind of like the penny problem, right? You take out five pennies, you write down their date, and then you find the mean of them. So this is the sampling distribution down here of that, that one number that we got. All right, Cody, what's the next part say? Those are a mean, right, and x bar. Oh, what's this guy, you guys? Yep. One standard deviation above, one standard deviation below. What is this right here, by the way? Standard deviation of five. So the population mean is 16, and the population standard deviation is five, okay? All right. What do you guys notice about the mean of the population and the mean of the sampling distribution? They're the same. And what do you notice about the standard deviation up here compared to the standard deviation down here? The population one is bigger, yep, and the sampling distribution is less because what formula did they use to get this lovely number 2.24? Sigma divided by square root of n. What's sigma? What goes in the top? Five, true standard deviation, divided by square root of n. What's n in this problem? Sample size of five, guys. n is actually five right here. That's it. All right. Um, that's pretty much it, you guys. We could change our sample size as the last, the next thing. What happens if um, I clear this and I change my sample size to like 20 and I do 10,000 again? What happens to the standard deviation? So as n increases, what happens to standard deviation? What also do you guys notice about the sampling distribution? It is normal. That's important. It's normal. Okay? Um, so sampling distributions of a sample mean from a normal population. Suppose that a population is normally distributed with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma, then the sampling distribution x bar has a normal distribution with a mean of mu and a standard deviation of this formula. So if the population is normal, what is the sampling distribution? It is also normal. So pay attention to the fact that the shapes will be the same there, um, and we'll learn tomorrow more about what happens if the population is skewed. But let's do a problem. Finding probabilities involving the sample mean. The height of young women follows a normal distribution with mean of 64.5 and standard deviation of 2.5. So this is the population right here. Part A, find the probability that a randomly selected young woman is taller than 66.5 inches. Now, part A, you guys, is not talking about a sample. It's talking about just the population. And it's important to know the difference here. This is exactly what we did in Chapter 2. So you guys can basically have done this problem in Chapter 2, where all we're doing is normal CDF. 
What's my lower bound going to be? Good. What's my upper bound going to be? Good. We're looking for people, women, 66.5 inches or taller. And what's my mean going to be? And what's my standard deviation? Notice my standard deviation is the same as the population because we're just talking about randomly selecting women from the population. And we get a .21 something. So there's about a 21% chance that you're going to find a woman that tall or taller. All right? <laughs> now, part B. Here's where you got to read carefully. Find the probability that the mean height of a simple random sample of 10 young women exceeds 66.5 inches. What's the difference? We're not drawing from necessarily the population. We're looking at our simple random sample of 10 young women. What's the only thing that changes if we're talking about a random sample versus population? Yes, the standard deviation is different. I have to find the standard deviation of x bar, which is equal to this lovely formula that we just learned. What goes in for sigma? 2.5, the true standard deviation. What goes in for n? There you go, 10. So this is my new standard deviation, which is 0.79. What do I have to check, though, to use this formula? Oh, good, 10% rule. What's n, little n going to be? Okay. Are there at least 100 women in the population? Yes. Okay, that'd be true. And then we can do normal CDF. And our lower bound. So now I'm looking for the probability that we're exceeding 66.5 out of our simple random sample of 10. So I still have 66.5. 10,000. And what's my mean going to be? It stays the same, 64.5. However, my standard deviation changed to 0.79. All right, that's the biggest point here is that you're doing a new formula with a different standard deviation. And on this one, we get 0 0.0057. Wow, that is quite a bit less likely, right? When we're doing a simple random sample of 10 people, it's quite a bit less likely I'm finding someone tall versus when I'm doing it out of the population, all right? Um, so find the probability that a randomly chosen pregnant woman has a pregnancy that lasts for more than 270 days. Bummer, all right? So normal CDF, what's the lower bound going to be? 70, what's the upper bound going to be? 10,000, what's the mean? What's standard deviation? Good, we're doing it out of the whole population on this one, right? So you keep your normal standard deviation the same, and you get a lovely probability of, we should see the, I should see this answer because I didn't know, 40%, dang, all right? <laughs> Suppose now we're doing a simple random sample of six pregnant women, all right? What is the mean of the sampling distribution? Just the mean. What's the mean? Same as the last one, right? 270. All right. Uh, what's the standard deviation going to be? What? Less than what? That's true. Less than 16. Do the formula. 16 divided by square root of 6, right? And check your 10% condition. We're doing 6. Yep, that works. Uh, be sure you actually check it, though. Right, so use your formula. And then, of course, now we're doing a, a new probability based on our sample. Uh, find the probability the mean pregnancy length for the women in the sample exceeds 270 days. So you do everything the same except for on your normal CDF, use your new standard deviation, and you get a 27% probability of exceeding. Okay? Make sense, you guys? <laughs>